Welcome to See You on the Other Side, where the world of the mysterious collides with the world of entertainment. A discussion of art, music, movies, spirituality, the weird, and self-discovery. And now, your hosts, musicians and entertainers who have their own weakness for the weird, Mike and Wendy from the band Sunspot. Episode 286, Chip Coffee. Now, you guys uh, might have seen Chip on Paranormal State or Psychic Kids. I think Paranormal State's the first time um, that I had had seen him work. And now, I mean, he's in shows like uh, Kindred Spirits. He's been in a bunch. He's been on Larry King Live. Um, everything from The Haunted Collector uh, to Good Morning America. Um, and CBS Sunday Morning. So Chip obviously has done his time in spreading the word. He's a psychic medium, paranormal investigator, and I've seen him speak uh, several times at the Michigan uh, Paracon. And we're excited because Chip is coming to Wisconsin for a special event, St. Patrick's Day, at the Palace Theater in the Wisconsin Dells. And we'll be talking a little bit more about that in a second. But for right now, let's welcome Chip Coffee to see you on the other side. How are you doing this fine morning? I am doing very well. Thank you so much. All right. I think for people who maybe they've seen you on television or maybe they're not too familiar, they, they, you know, they, they see you like walk into a scene, uh, give your psychic uh, impressions and things like that, or, you know, what you're kind of seeing or feeling at a time. And um, to me, when I see somebody walk in, you know, like walk into a scene on a TV show or whatever and be like, okay, I'm psychic. Here's the deal. I'm always like, all right. I would have liked to learn a little bit more about that person <laughs> before they just kind of showed up and started saying they were getting messages from beyond. So, you know, I was wondering a little bit about, like, what was the moment that you discovered that um, you might be different than the average person, at least when it comes to spirituality? Well, I, I consider myself different in a lot of ways than the average <laughs> person. Normal is not a word that was ever used to describe me in any shape, form, or fashion. Um, As far as the psychic stuff goes, I can tell you that I think everyone has some level of psychic ability. In some, it's enhanced more than in others. My abilities first manifested themselves prior to my even having conscious memory of it. I was told that as a child I would be playing with my toys, and all of a sudden I would stop and look at the phone, and shortly thereafter the phone would ring. And... Later on, when I became verbal, I would say a name, look at the phone, and that person would call shortly thereafter. So you were like so, you were like caller ID before caller I was ID like was the there. Early, you were one hundred percent correct. I was like the early version of caller ID. You know, back in the nineteen fifties. So, you know, I, I began to know things when I would go places about people, places, or things. I lived in a haunted house when I was an adolescent boy. And, you know, it just sort of, it, the abilities just sort of grew a bit and manifested. Uh, I didn't start talking to the dead until I was in my 40s. I think that gift was given when I was ready to receive it. And I was working in the travel industry, and one of my coworkers, her deceased brother, started communicating with me, and I thought I'd gone out of my mind. But I found out that the information I was receiving, the messages that I was receiving, were indeed valid, and that sort of flung the door open. And since that time, which was in 2001, I've done thousands of readings for clients and talked to thousands of dead people. And and that sounds crazy for me to even say today, but it just, it is what it is. Okay, so you had like a, a regular life before you came into the paranormal world. Actually, I still have a regular life because I certainly don't consider myself psychic medium chip coffee (laughs) 24-7. Sure. 365, 66, and leap year. You know, I, I, when I'm working, I'm working. When I'm not working, I'm doing what everybody else does. I'm letting my dogs out in the backyard. I'm, you know, emptying the dishwasher. I'm watching my favorite TV shows. So I, I lead a very normal third dimension life, but when I'm working and I need to focus on my work, that's when I tap in and see what I'm going to get. And so you, know, so you were saying that um, the first chance you had to, or the you know that the gift of speaking to the dead, you know, came in the 2000s. But if you've had some kind of ability or been able to tap into something, um, 
was it something that you real because I'm thinking about when I was a kid and I've all we watched Star Wars and I was old enough to where um I think I saw but the first Star Wars movie I saw in the theater was Return of the Jedi and so I'm thinking like how can I get some of Luke's powers like you know everybody tried to like at a pencil or whatever tried to use the force to draw it to them and so um and you know or tried to predict the future or tried to like oh if I think hard enough then this girl's gonna like me or at least no she you know all those kind of things that as a kid you you know the silly things that go through your head but for me at least nothing ever happened was there something um that happened to you in particular that you remember where you're like I I I dreamed this and this happened or I could predict it and this happened and then you're like holy crap this is more than just an intuition this is something that um is feels very real um first you said the word powers and that's a word that i don't ever use to describe my abilities i describe them as a gift because i do believe that the abilities that i have are a gift from god or a skill set or talent those are words i use power seems just too grandiose to me sure and i never want to to give that impression that i think what i can do is it's grandiose. It's just become a real part of who I am. Um, as far as a, an exact moment or moments that I might remember, one thing comes to mind. I remember being a kid, and my mom has had this friend whose name was Hazel. And Hazel was, by that point in time, 40-ish or so. And it would have been unlikely to say what I was going to say to her. But I climbed out of bed one morning. This was when we were living in a haunted house in upstate New York. Okay. I climbed out of bed, and Hazel was downstairs having coffee with my mom. She had come by for a visit. And um, I greeted her, and we chatted for a minute, and my mom said, um, Hazel has something she wants to tell, tell you. And I blurted out, Oh, she's pregnant. When's the baby coming? Mm. Now, you wouldn't have thought, because most ladies at that point in time were not having babies into their late 30s and 40s. Right. When I was a kid back in the 60s or early 70s. But Hazel was indeed pregnant. So that was just one of those moments that I knew something that I couldn't know pragmatically by using my five human senses. It was information that I'd received from a kind of an unknown source. Sure. And it had to be intuitive information. And it, it, those are, a lot of the things that I knew when I was little were just little things. You know, small items of information about people, places, and things that just, you shouldn't be able to know using your five human senses. Well, and, you know, I think little examples like that, because um, we always, you know, say with psychics or whatever, well, if you're so psychic, why don't you win the lottery, blah, blah, blah. But it, it, it's it's little things like that, like, oh, I know Hazel's pregnant, or I know who's going to call. It It's almost, instead of, like you like you say, the grandiose use of the word powers, in, you know, <laughs> instead of these yeah. mighty psychic X-Man powers that you might have, it's more like um, being in tune with what's going to happen. Really, you're absolutely correct. It's more like tapping into information and not... I have no idea how I do what I do or how anyone does what they do in the paranormal or spiritual or psychic medium realm. I have no clue. I don't know how this stuff happens. It's just in my head, and I get the information, and I share it. So I, I, I can't tell you how people do what they do. People like me do what they do. Uh, I, it's, it's, it's a mystery to me. It just happens. When you made the jump to um, starting to do these readings, like you said, talking to th- I mean thousands of people, and you're at uh, paranormal conventions all over the country, and like trips, and um, I mean, when I look at you know Chip Coffee's webpage or like your events or things like that, you're always all over the place, and so now mm-hmm. you're doing this stuff all the time. But making that jump, like I, I feel that um, going from somebody who just says like, well, I'm a little bit psychic or whatever. Um, and I, sometimes I, sometimes I tap into something and it's pretty cool, um, to, all right, you know, I'm going to have psychic medium or I'm going to have, I talk to the dead on my business card. Like what kind of emotional jump, um, was that for you to actually move into the field? Let's talk about that process. I certainly worked a lot of what I call survival jobs before I started doing what I'm doing now. Sure. 
you know, I worked in a lot of fields. I worked as an actor. I worked as uh, in the field of, of regular counseling and psychology. I worked for a Head Start program right out of college as a special needs coordinator and a social worker. I worked in a on the locked unit of a psychiatric facility on the adolescent ward for a while. I worked in the hospitality industry, both in, in hotel reservations and in the travel industry as an agent. And in those jobs, you're working kind of paycheck to paycheck. Sure. And in the years prior to becoming a professional psychic and medium, the, the 16 years prior, I've been working in the travel industry as an agent. And it wasn't an extremely well-paying industry, so I knew I had these talents that I could utilize, and I felt like I could help people by utilizing my psychic abilities. So after the mediumship came into play, I thought it might be nice to make a little extra money by working a part-time job giving psychic readings. So I found a platform to do that. And I was making some extra money working part-time. And then after 9-11 happened, shortly after 9-11 happened, I very unceremoniously lost my job because the travel industry basically tanked. No one was traveling. Everyone was fearful about travel. Sure. Well, you, I mean, tra- there was those times where the, the, the whole, I mean, the airports were shut down for several days. Absolutely. And travel agencies closed their doors or they, they, they fired a lot of their staff because they just weren't getting the business. And I was one of those casualties. So when that happened, prior to that, for a few months, I'd been, as I said, doing some part-time psychic readings. And when I got fired from my travel agency job because of the downturn in the travel industry, I walked out of the building with my belongings in a box. And I remember thinking to myself, well, I guess you're a full-time psychic and medium now. And honestly, I didn't have any confidence that I was going to be able to support my habits of living indoors and eating by being a full-time psychic and medium. But, you know, I worked hard, and I was ambitious, and decided that I was going to give this the best go that I possibly could. And with those things being said and some great opportunities that have come my way, it's been pretty successful for me thus far. So how did you set up, like, um, you know, when you're – because, I mean, I guess it's 2001, 2002. It's in the Internet time, so you can put up a – But, like, you could run a Google ad or something. But how did people find out about you? Did you have an ad in the yellow pages? Did you put it out there? Did you just start saying among your friends, like, hey, I'd like to help you and and, um, let me see if I can? Like, how does that – like, how does it work? Like, how did you get business? The first thing that I did was I worked on a psychic hotline. And a lot of well-known psychics have started like that working on a psychic hotline, and I built that from doing phone readings to working in a shop here in the Atlanta area where I live, and I started table at some events that were around the country and going and doing readings for people at these events. And my name started to get known, and my reputation started to get known kind of in the circuit, And I started getting asked to go do events. And after doing events for a while, one of the event coordinators was called by Paranormal State. You mentioned that earlier. Yeah. And they were looking for a new psychic to appear on their show. And I got the phone call one day in January in 2007 and was interviewed by one of the producers, then by the star of the show. And later that night, after figuring, well, if it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, it doesn't. Right. No harm, no foul. The travel coordinator called me and said, I hear you're, you're going to be on our next episode of, of the show. And my response was, well, heck, I'm the psychic, and you know more than I do. <laughs> right. So, you know, I, this was on a Wednesday. On a Friday, I flew out of Atlanta to Philadelphia, drove a bit, and went and did an episode of the show. And I'm kind of proud to say that after that episode was filmed, the producer that I mentioned talking to originally 
walked me out to my car to drive back to the airport in Philadelphia with his arm around my shoulder and said, Chip Coffee, you have just elevated this show to an entirely new level. So that was very gratifying to hear those words, and I thought, well, maybe this is a one and done. But right. I wound up doing 30-something episodes of the show, and it's just been, it's been a very nice build in my career. And do I have any idea where it's going to go? No, because I don't read for myself very well. But, you know, so far, so good. And I'm coming to the Dells. Right. And, right. Well, the thing is, that also, um, that kind of notoriety has given you a chance to, you know, spread your message and let people, like, get a sneak preview of, like, okay, this is how he works, so maybe I want to go there in person and check it out. And I think that's right. – um, so they can – so instead of walking in and be like, oh, because I'm going to see psychics for fun or, you know, I don't know. My wife, like, got me for my birthday and everything, and I love going and going through the whole reading and stuff. And uh, you never know what you're going to get. But if you see someone work on TV or whatever, then you're like, okay, now I kind of know what I'm going to get um, when I get in there. Or I know how it's going to go or, or their personality. I never, I never know what my reading – I never know what my readings are going to look like. Never. <laughs> I, I never have any idea. Every reading, there may be some common threads, but every reading, because the connection, the energetic connection I'm making with individuals is different. Everybody's somewhat different. So some people have the misguided impression that this is, especially if you go to see a psychic, it's going to be sad if you're talking to a dead relative, or it's going to be... They might just have preconceived notions of whatever those happen to be. Sure, because but a lot I of people find, go and they're grieving. Of course. But most of the readings that I do are very life-affirming. They're very emotional, but not, you know, tragic or sad. You, you, I, I, I want to... My goal is to leave my class feeling good about the situation. I want to to bring comfort and healing and clarity with whatever I do. When we talk about the, you know, every reading, every person is different. You say, yeah. um, one thing I'm interested in is how, how these things, or I mean, how the messages a- appear to you or how you perceive them. Cause when you're talking about it being a kid, you're like, Oh, here's a couple of things where I just kind of blurted stuff out where it seems like the message came out of you before traveling through your frontal lobe or whatever first, um, yeah. You know, and so when you receive something or maybe when you first had that when you were with your coworker or whatever, and you're like, hey, your deceased brother's talking. Um, how did the deceased brother show up? Was it visual? Was it auditory? <laughs> Was it I mean, how do you perceive these messages and how do you how do you get them as far as to try to explain it to us um, who, who maybe third eye is a little cross eyed? Great question. The dead will get messages to me any way that they can, however they can. It's not like us having a conversation right now. It's just, it's, it's different, and I'll try to explain a little bit. Okay. Sometimes the messages come to me as like a little flash, like a still photography photo. Sometimes they'll come through like a little video. Sometimes it's just a feeling. It can be... It can be a, a, like a sound, although not necessarily hearing the sound, or a taste, although not necessarily tasting the taste. It's just however they can get that information through to me. And I'll give you an example of that. One day I was doing a reading for a lady, and she wanted to talk to her grandmother, I believe. This was years ago. And grandma showed me everything to do with the country of China. Tiananmen Square. She showed me food. She showed me a fortune cookie. She showed me whatever could, could have anything to do with China. And I said that to my client. Nope, Grandma didn't love China. She didn't have anything really to do with China. And I'm like, okay, let's just put that on hold. Hold on to that information and see if it makes sense to you later without having to stretch it too far to make it fit. Just hold on to China. And then Grandma showed me one perfect red rose. And I mentioned that to my client. Nope, Grandma wasn't a big rose fan. Grandma didn't, nobody put a rose on her coffin. Grandma loved wildflowers. She didn't really like the fancy flowers, like roses. So I'm thinking, I I don't know why she's showing me this. We're kind of going off track here with this reading. And then the lady said, well, hold on a minute. She said, when my grandma died, I inherited her china, and it's a rose pattern. Could that be it? 
Well, of course that's it. Grandma could not show me just a cup or a plate with a rose on it. I don't know. But all Grandma wanted me to say was China and Rose. And we had to kind of connect those dots, which sometimes you have to do during a reading. You have to connect dots without kind of trying to fit a square peg in a round hole. But Grandma evidently couldn't show me or didn't show me a plate with a rose on it. She showed me everything China and everything Rose, and my job was to say China and Rose. And, and so th- that was somebody who was right in front of you? Well, I do all my readings by phone, all my private readings by phone. Okay. So this was a phone client. Okay, so that, I, mean, those, I, I was and, interested and in the difference yeah. there, too, in, in that, I, because you say when you first started working, you worked on the psychic hotline, uh, whatever, and I remember, like, I did the... Um, I was like right out of college and working from home and writing and things like that. And I signed up for the psychic hotline and they, they sent me like, uh, like the training or whatever. And it was just like tarot card readings and stuff. And I was thinking, and I, you know, only did it a short time, but I remember like looking at the tarot card, like just trying to explain that. And like, I'm like, I'm not getting anything here. So maybe I should, maybe I should leave this line of work. Um, but and that's why I was wondering, is it different in person or on the phone, like when you get some kind of message? It's always nice to be able to see my clients, mm-hmm. but I, I don't find phone readings, for me at least, to be any less valid or accurate than an in-person reading. They both just seem to work for me. So it's it's the person. It's not the, it's not like the 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 proximity. You know what I mean? Because I'm always you always yeah. think that because in real life you're like, well, I want to look a guy in the eye, and that's the only way I'm gonna know him. Um, but it it doesn't seem like proximity has any effect on your gift. No, it doesn't. I have clients that I've talked to from the other side of the world, and that that proximity doesn't really. I haven't noticed any demonstrable difference between a live reading and a, a, a telephone reading. Well, I guess if the person's going to, I mean, you know, if the, if the message is going to come through or whatever um, from uh, a different dimension or whatnot, then I guess even a couple of thousand miles uh, doesn't seem that big of a dis- difference uh, if they're already coming so far. Or half a globe away. It doesn't really make a difference. It's all about energy. And there are certain energetic things that none of us understand how it works. You know, I, I use this example a lot. I use this example of, of psychic stuff on a very rudimentary level. Um, I would imagine that most of us have just kind of, quote-unquote, randomly thought of a friend or a loved one that we haven't seen in a while. And their, their, their presence, so to speak, comes into our heads. And shortly after that, they eat all our text or show up or will I would, I would imagine that most of us have had that happen. Well, I think that's probably some sort of precognition that we're going to run into them, or we've put that energy out and somehow the universe decides that our paths are going to cross. I don't know what that is, but I know that happens to a lot of people. And it really is, on a very basic level, what you said. It's, it's tapping into that intuitive part of ourselves, that little voice, and just listening to it. And, you know, as you've developed this, have you found that it's been easier to tap into it over time or you get better at figuring out what the messages are um, that are maybe psychic messages or that, and then the messages that are just are like, oh, I must be hungry or something like that. Like, is it is it hard to differentiate between um, what we think of as terrestrial thoughts and the non, you know, terrestrial thoughts? No, because the thoughts that I'm getting inside my head or the, the images or messages or whatever from spirit are very different. They just feel different, like they don't belong to me as opposed to, to my own personal thoughts. They feel, they feel foreign, so to speak. Okay. So it's not at all difficult for me to differentiate between psychic thoughts or messages and my own personal thoughts in my head right because that that probably would, would get me like i'm like oh am i just thinking this stuff but i guess it's that it is that feeling of um someone else talking in your head that might be you know that might give you that kind of uh the borderline between this is what i'm thinking and then this is whatever i'm receiving yeah. whatever it might be well I'll, t- I'll tell you another story that i think is is gratifying to me again when i first started doing this type of work I, I would censor sometimes because if I didn't understand the message, I figured my client wasn't going to understand it. 
So this lady called me at one point in time, and she said her, her fear was that her deceased father didn't know where the family had moved. They had, since he had passed, they had changed residences. And she said, I used to feel my dad around me in my house all the time at our old house, and now I don't feel him at all. And I remember saying to her, well, I don't think it works that way. I think that he probably knows where you're at, but let's just tap in and see what we get. And the first thing that came into my mind was waterfall. I don't remember if I heard the word or actually saw an image, but waterfall was the first thing I got. And I censored. I didn't say the word. I went on and gave her other messages from her dad. And before we hung up the phone... I said to the woman, look, right at the beginning of our reading, I got a a, a word, just one kind of word from your dad, and I don't know if this means anything to you or whatever, but I'm going to give it to you, and just hold on to it if it doesn't mean anything. She said, okay. And I said, the word that I got was waterfall, and she gasped and started to cry. And I said, well, evidently that must mean something to you immediately. What does that mean to you? She said, now I know that my dad knows where we are because at our new house we have a waterfall in the backyard. Uh-huh. He answered the question immediately with something that was very distinct, and that was the waterfall at the new house in the backyard. So s- sometimes you're getting a message that you don't even know why, and it's, it has to be the, up to the person to get it. So it's not like you're designing the message for them. You're just saying the words that show up. I'm, I'm kind of like, well, that's what the word medium means. Uh, you're, oh, sure. you're in between. You're in between. You're, you're doing, my job is to deliver the message, and that's all it is. It's through me, not for me, in most instances. And I deliver the message, and then that's, that's what I, I fulfill my obligation. Sometimes the client and I will kind of talk through things about what this could possibly mean, but sometimes the message isn't immediately clear to my clients. And I tell them, you know, don't toss it aside, think about it, but don't try to fit a square peg in a round hole, think out what it means. Don't stretch anything too far to make this message meaningful. And talk to family members or friends. They may be able to help you decipher something that's cryptic. And then there's the third aspect of it. We could be talking about a future event. And sometimes spirit is able to give us glimpses of what the future looks like. So there, there are all those factors that come into play for a message not immediately being able to... Zero one. Hold on. Did, did you hear something right there? I didn't. What did you hear? I, it, it's, I heard somebody else's... I heard a woman's voice come in and say zero one. So I just kind of, I was like, oh, what's that? Um, uh oh. They're with us, I guess. I don't yeah, know. They're with us, or it's um, uh, sometimes, you know, how the, uh, the connections can be. But it was just a funny thing because you're like, you know, sometimes they say things random, and then all of a sudden I hear the woman's voice go, zero one. Um, but when you talk does about. That mean anyth- does that mean anything to you, zero it, one? It doesn't mean anything to me today, but that doesn't mean I still got a long day to go. You know, when you talk about glimpses of the future, there, uh, what what I think uh, is interesting is, have you had any glimpses for yourself of things that would happen or any uh, troubles in your life that your psychic ability or you know your gifts have at least given you a chance to, to better navigate through it, or you knew you'd turn out okay on the other side? Has there been any challenges that you faced that? Um, you don't think you could have gotten through without your gifts? No, and I'll tell you why. I'm, most psychics, I, like most psychics, I'm not able to read effectively for myself. And quite honestly, I don't know that I want to because I kind of like having life be an adventure and everything kind of being new and not having, uh, not having that realization. Not everybody's like me, thank goodness, or I'd be out of a job. But... <laughs> But, you know, I'm kind of good with letting life sort of play its way out. And for me, it's kind of a, and I hope this doesn't sound too Pollyanna, but it's kind of a faith thing that everything's going to work out the way it's supposed to. You know, I don't always, and the spiritual path is that I don't, 
I don't always get what I ask for or pray for because I'm not looking always or maybe never at the, the, the greater picture, the, the, the bigger picture. I don't always see the grand scheme of things. So I suppose from a divine standpoint, if it's not right all the way around, I'm not going to get my, my wish. But nonetheless, I, I have faith that whatever is supposed to happen in my life is going to happen. And I'm that type of person that just says, whatever befalls me, I'm going to, in one way or another, find a way to deal with. And I, I feel for me that works, and that's a pretty good, pretty good perspective on life. Sure. Um, and that's, I mean, that's a positive message that can work for anybody. But Sure, absolutely. You know, you mentioned faith there. And did you grow up in a religious household? I was raised in a Catholic family, and I still call myself a Catholic, a Roman Catholic, and a Christian, although I've grown up some where, where, where my faith is involved. I, I've sort of integrated some of my spiritual beliefs into, into the Catholicism, and although I don't I'm not a big fan of the Catholic Church, but I still embrace the faith. I don't really particularly like organized religion at all. If others do, that's fine. If that works for them, it just doesn't really work for chip coffee because of a variety of reasons. But as far as faith and belief goes, and I don't want to get too preachy here, but I want people to understand who I am. God is everything to me. And that's what I call my higher power. I feel like I am working in tandem with God and doing something with the gift that he gave me. And if I didn't, that feels kind of akin to spitting in the eye of God. Yeah. And so I don't ever want to do that. As a matter of fact, right on the face of my website, on the homepage of my website, it said, I want my life to make God smile. So that's the way I try to lead my life with, with a lot of, gratitude and a lot of trying to give to others and be of service to others and and just to lead a lead a good conscious life i have a friend do you ever watch television I'll, i'm going to i'm going to shamelessly name drop here do you ever have you ever seen a show on television called NCIS yes I have a good friend who was on that show for many years and her name is Polly Perret and she played Abby the lab tech on NCIS Okay. And we've had some very deep conversations about religion and about spirituality and about faith. And we were having a very lovely discussion once, and she said, let's just cut to the chase here, Chip Puffy. She (laughs) said, this is how I pray. (laughs) And her simple prayer, my friend, was this. She said, thank you for everything. And please forgive me for everything. And those words not only not only touched my heart, they touched my soul because there was such simplicity and such power in those words. And and with attribution to Polly and unashamedly, I I stole in the best possible sense of the word those words and that simple prayer from her and integrated it into my daily prayers. It's the way all my prayers start, and I've asked that that be a constant, constant, endless loop tape that's playing inside my head. Thank you for everything, and please forgive me for everything. Well, that's a very, that's a very, uh, that's a very Catholic prayer. Uh, all you need is the Virgin Mary there, because, I mean, the idea of not only, you know, gratitude and acceptance, but also the idea of reconciliation. It is, 100%. And Polly being, Polly being Protestant and not Catholic, I mean, it's, it should be just our human prayer. Right, I De- mean, default. Without religion even being involved in That's it. Sure. Whatever, whatever you believe in, ju- just, you know, here's the deal. I'm, I'm going to tell you what I think every religious book should say. It, every religious book should really be one page long, okay? And you know what that one page sh- should say? Let's hear it. And you can edit this out if it doesn't fit into your broadcast, but that one page should say, don't be a dick. <laughs> right, that's, you don't need too much more than that, do you? Just 
don't be a dick. You know, just be a decent human being. And you want to hear something that Spirit told me a while back? You want to hear this story? Mm, oh, yeah. A while back, during a moment of quiet reflection, and I say that because I cannot classically slow my mind down to meditate. So I call it just kind of sitting and being. So in one of those moments a while back, I asked my spirit partners, what is the meaning of life? And they laughed at me. And it pissed me off. <laughs> because I thought it was a valid question. And they said, Chip, the meaning of life is very simple. Just get through it the best way you can. And I thought that was such a glib and pat answer. And I said, you're going to have to give me more. And they said, you who are in the human form tend to complicate everything. You make things so complicated, but let us really simplify this for you. The universe, God, spirit, whatever you want to call the, the all that is, asks only two things of you. Two things. And here they are. Do no intentional harm to yourself or to others, and get happy. And my mind immediately thought, well, that's just really too simple. And they thought, just think about it. Just think about it. And I did. I pondered on it. And in its simplicity, it became pretty enormous, if you think about it. Do no intentional harm to yourself or others, and get happy. And do those things in tandem. And that really covers a lot of ground. So... That's kind of become my mantra of how to lead my life. Don't hurt anybody intentionally or hurt myself intentionally and just find out what it is that makes me happy and go about doing it. Now, that doesn't mean that harming somebody else, if that makes me happy or other, any other being. <laughs> right. You I can't just be like, it really, make, it really makes me happy to stab this guy. It really makes me happy to, you know, do something, to commit a terrorist act. <laughs> you know, no, you can't do that. Because you've got to do those things in tandem. Do no harm to yourself or to others intentionally and get happy. So if you do those things in tandem, that covers a heck of a lot of ground. Well, I mean, when you talk about harm to yourself, I mean, you harm yourself when you hold negative energy or when you hate other people or when you do self-destructive, when you, um, you know, go against what you know is good for you. Absolutely. Absolutely. And if you do things that you know are going to negatively impact one other person or a group, if you do it with malintent, then I believe that's a sin. I believe that's what really is a sin. If you, if you go about intentionally trying to harm someone, that's, that's my classic definition of a sin. And unfortunately, there's a lot of that that goes around in the world, and, and that, that, I think, is what makes God give us the side eye. Sure, that's a good way to put it. That's a good way to put it. Um, you know, one thing I, I, was, I was thinking about and I know you came up this the memoir, uh, Growing Up Psychic, uh, my I story did. of not just surviving but thriving and how others like me can too. And you guys can find that. We have links to Chip's books and tickets to the show and stuff like that are going to be at othersidepodcast.com uh, slash 286 is where you can can find those things if, if you're not at your computer right now. But, um, you know, when, when you were going over your memoirs and when you were writing that, did you come up with a time where like maybe you'd received a message that – you didn't want to get or, you know, cause we talk about a lot of life affirming stuff and uh, a lot of positive things, but it seems to me that foreknowledge of the future or knowing sometimes what people think or can be as much of a curse as, as, as a gift. And do you have any particular times you remember, or maybe when you were thinking about for the book to add some drama or whatever, where you're like, Oh, I, I, I really wish I could unlearn this. Well, let me talk about my book for a second. It's part autobiography and part kind of how-to for anyone who's raising a psychic kid. And it's also been very cathartic for those who were raised a psychic kid and misunderstood to read. So I, I often suggest that as a good jumping-off point for folks. And, you know, it's not an expensive book. It's paperback. It's about 15 bucks, I think. So, you know, I, I, I urge people to read it if they've got questions about their, their own abilities or questions about someone in their family that has abilities. And as far as delivering a message that's not always, quote, unquote, good, yes, there have been times when I've got to deliver a message that is tough, you know, that someone's not doing well, that something's going to happen that's not necessarily a positive thing. And because I was trained in psychology and traditional counseling and those sort of things, I know that my words can either help or hurt, or can harm or heal. So I try to choose those words carefully 
and deliver that message as compassionately and gently as I possibly can. But my job is to deliver a message, so I, I won't censor. I will definitely choose my words cautiously, but I don't, I don't censor. Well, has anything ever been, I mean, to you, it's like a message for you specifically that, um, you know, not maybe in a reading, but just something that you kind of got that you were like, oh, I wish I didn't know that. Like anything that, that, that like happened to you, I just, uh, and maybe not something for someone, but a message meant for you. No, I've never had that happen. I mean, I don't, I don't, I, I, I think I'm following your question. No, nothing personal, like I said. Sure. I sometimes have great difficulty with reading for myself, and I'm not one of the psychics who has the ability to actually readily predict world events. Like, I couldn't say, oh, you know, I, I thought the tsunami was going to happen, or I thought this was going to happen, or that was going to happen. Although, at one point in time, I was visiting a friend in California, and she had to come into the room I was sleeping in. I was staying at her house, and she had a, an infant, and I was sleeping in the kids' room. And she had moved all the kids into her room and put them in various beds, whatever. And so she came in after I'd already gone in to go to sleep to get the baby's blanket because he was fussy wanting his, his whoopee. And <laughs> so I, evidently, when she came in, she saw me stir, and she said, I'm so sorry to wake you up. And evidently, I sat up in bed and said, something bad's about to happen. The angels are gathering. Oh, my gosh. And I laid back down. And Oh, and man, that would freak me out. I'd be like, yeah. wake your ass up, and we're going to talk about this. Yeah, let's talk. Let's talk. So we, we talked about it the next morning, and I'm like, I have no conscious memory of this. Well, that day or the next day, I don't remember which, I mentioned the tsunami, and that is actually when the tsunami in wherever it was, happened. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, and, and, I mean, that's that's a lot heavier than I even expected. I was thinking more just like little things like you're out at a dinner party or whatever and you meet a couple and you're like, oh, she's cheating on him. You know, <laughs> little, little things like that. Um, oh, I know stuff like that all the time. All right. <laughs> that's, I mean, I know stuff like that all the time. <laughs> and do I always share that information? No. And one thing... It's funny, I was talking about this on social media earlier today. I will never do ambush readings. And you know what those are? Will you come up to somebody and say there's, like somebody's got a message for you or something? One thousand percent. You don't just walk up to somebody, at least I think it's wrong. It's called trespassing, psychic trespassing. You don't just walk up to somebody in a restaurant or a bar or something or a mall and say, Oh, I got something I've got to tell you. <laughs> you know, no, 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 hell no. Because that is, that's am an ambush reading. If I've got something that I'm supposed to share with somebody, I will always ask permission before I share. And when my clients book an appointment with me, they've given me implied permission to read sure. them. So that's different. Or if they attended one of my events, they've given me implied permission to, to read for them. And even at my events, if you're coming to my event there in the Dells, you'll see that I ask people in the audience to raise their hands before I do a reading for them. So I don't, I can't say I've never picked on somebody in the audience who hasn't got their <laughs> hand raised, but I'll always ask, do you want to hear what I'm supposed to tell you? And if they say no, then fine and dandy, I won't give that message. But the vast majority of people who may be a little shy or reluctant to raise their hand at one of my live events, I, I will... I will ask permission if I get something that's directed toward them. Well, and I think this is a good place uh, to actually ask um, if people have not attended one of your events or uh, attended an event like this. Like, how is yeah. it set up and, and what happens? When, you know, you take a place like you're in a theater or uh, like, you know, when you were in Michigan, you're at the big theater at the casino at, in the yeah. Dells, you'll be at the Palace Theater. Like, what's the setup? Like, you're not going to come up there with a top hat and a cane and sing putting on the Ritz for us. Like, what, what, so what happens? Well, I might. All right. I would actually, that would be pretty sweet. If time permits, we may <laughs> do a little, uh, just for you, <laughs> sweet. we may do a little putting on the Ritz. Uh, you know, <laughs> right, young Frankenstein style. We'll go a little young Frankenstein on you here, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. No, what happens generally at my events, which I call gallery readings, and this is the plan for the Palace Theater at the Wisconsin Dells on no, uh, November. It's not November. It's March 17th. It's St. Patrick's Day. That's right. So that was, that was a lovely, shameless plug. Um, the way it's structured is I will come out 
and do a little Q&A. People can ask me about the shows that I've been on, ask me questions about their own personal stuff. We'll, we'll see how that goes, you know, if it goes for when people are asking questions. You know, that'll work well. If not, you know, we'll probably take a break after a short amount of time, and then I will come back on, explain how the readings are going to go and what they're going to look like, and then open that up to people raising their hands if they want me to come to them, and whoever spirit leads me to, then I will go to that individual person. Unlike other people who you may have watch them on television or gone to one of their events, I typically don't just randomly pick someone out of the audience and do open channeling. I don't do open channeling. Open channeling is where any spirit that wants to can come through. That to me is like walking into a crowded room and everyone trying to get my attention at once. So instead I do what's called direct connection. And I let my clients tell me who it is in their heart of hearts they want me to try to reach out to, what individual soul they I do that for them. Or we'll do psychic readings. They can ask me questions about relationships or romance or career or finances or any of those things that are kind of like past, present, future in their lives. So I'm going to do two different kinds of readings. And I want to stress to people that it's not weird or spooky or creepy. It's, it's actually the opposite of that. It's, as I said before, it can be kind of life-affirming. And, you know, sometimes, yes, there are tears shed. Sometimes we laugh because I have a tendency to be kind of off the wall and funny. So it's, it's kind of like a mixed bag of a lot of stuff. Sure. And well, that, cause that's what I was kind of wondering. I was wondering like when you, you know, when you're there, you're, you know, you're in front of a couple hundred people or a few hundred people. I mean, it can be up to like a big crowd. And I was just wondering like, if it's all like you just, you open your eyes and you're like, holy crap. They're here, and like they're all coming to you at once because everybody oh, wants to I, talk to their kid or their grandkid or something like that. You know, it's I feel my spirit partners will lead me to that person or persons who are supposed to have a reading at that time and place. So that's the way I choose. And you know, there'll there'll be people running microphones through the audience. They'll pass the mic to the person, and we'll get down to business. They'll tell me what they want me to do, and I will try to try to do what they want me to do. So you have this herd of people that are lining up. I don't want my abilities. I've sort of fine-tuned my abilities, so to speak, so as not to work in that fashion. Okay. I, no one wants to be overwhelmed. You don't want to feel like, oh, my God, I've got to duck and cover. You don't want to, I don't want to feel that way. Huh. It's, more, it's more of a controlled sort of a thing for me. And um, what, you know, one last question. In, you know, it talks about your book. One of the things it says in the book is like, hey, Chip Coffee helps to show you how to deal with skeptics and disbelievers. And I'm sure you, know, you probably get that constantly because um, people are like, oh, you're psychic? Yeah, right. Or I saw James the Amazing Randy do the exact same thing that you can do. Um, mm-hmm. Like how do you, you know, when somebody comes up and you're like, well, I'm here to help or anything like that, um, how do you deal with that? I actually don't give a rosy red rat's ass. <laughs> I don't care. You know, believe what you want to believe. Just don't come for me and try to be confrontational because you don't believe, because you're a skeptic. And, and, and sadly, the word skeptic in a lot of ways, and a lot of skeptics that I've come into contact with, have indeed been rapid, rapid disbelievers. And... The way that they approach it is to try to take a healthy dump on the beliefs of other people. So that's really no different than being a member of the Westboro Baptist Church. You're trying to say that anyone who doesn't believe as you believe is wrong or bad. So I've been confronted by those people, and the way that I've found to best deal with them is just not to deal with them. You know, I'm not going to... I'm not going to allow them to run roughshod over me because I'm going to fire back in certain instances. But I'll give you an example. I had a group come to one of my events in California with the sole intention of discrediting me. And they had actually built Facebook pages, I found out, 
with talking about their dead loved ones, fake Facebook pages, talking about their dead loved ones with the hope that I would research it or my team would research. This. Sure. Like, like Steve Martin and Leap of Faith when they're feeding them stuff through the earpiece and stuff. Well, I invite anybody to come up on stage with me and see if I've got an earpiece in because <laughs> I don't. But the deal is they went to that trouble. They funded themselves and bought tickets to come to my event. But before they came, they came with prefabricated stories about fictitious dead relatives and even brought pictures and whatever. And they dressed in garish clothing and they sat pretty close to the front. And here's the rub. This had happened before and I knew of this group and so did my team because one of their people tried to use a fake ticket and come to my event a few weeks earlier. And he had to be thrown out of the event. And we fully recognized who he was, so we did some research online. This time we did do research and found out who a lot of them were. They're, they like to brag, so there's tons of photographs of them online. <laughs> I mean, they just love to be high profile, and pretty much they've taken over any spiritual or paranormal websites on Wikipedia, including mine, and have just, their sole goal is to, to destroy anything that doesn't fit into their own little paradigm. Not a belief system. Most of them, yeah, most of them are, are atheists, or a lot of them are atheists. So, I recognized these people. I'd seen their photographs. I knew who they were. So I thought, I'll give them what they want. I'll, I, they're here to yank my you-know-what, and I'm just going to yank back. So I gave them readings, and here's the rub. They came to me with lies, and they had created, listen to what they created. One of them was a woman who created the fact that the person she wanted to reach out to was her young, like toddler-sized child who supposedly had run into the street and been killed by a car. That's pretty sick. You want to hear what's even sicker? One of the other women in this group her fictitious dead relative was her sister who died at the Trade Center on 9-11. Mm. That's, that's pretty reprehensible to come with that sort of lie. A dead child hit by a car and someone who died on 9-11. I gave them what they wanted, and then they bragged about how they had stung me. They had hoodwinked me. No, they didn't. And here's the thing, what I always tell my clients, because we, I don't understand. I said it right at the beginning of this interview. I don't understand how energy or messages work. But if you create this scenario of lies, I could be picking up on your lies. Right. That's why I it, read a book called The Philip Experiment. It was done, and they actually created a spirit named Philip, gave him all his attributes. They, they, they created a person, a dead person who never lived. It was all in their imagination and in their creation. And here's what happened. Philip started to communicate with them. Right, right. <laughs> and, and I think that's the, I mean, that's a powerful lesson because the, the whole time I was thinking was like, whether or not you gave them the fake information or gave them the real information, the fact that you could give them information that you didn't have before you got there, um, like, I, I, to me, that's enough. I'm like, all right, well, if <laughs> he didn't read, you know, um, it's that kind of thing. And the Philip experiment really shows that w what kind of realities we can create if we focus hard enough. Right. And they had focused very hard. They had focused very hard on creating these fictitious dead relatives. I mean, they, they put a lot of power into this so to speak. You know, I can see the I can see the attraction to it, but to me it's like if you're going to put that much focus into something, why don't you try to focus on the, you know, the people that actually meant something to you? Why don't you actually focus on doing something that's meaningful and worthwhile rather than taking your crap on the belief system of other people and trying to destroy others? Remember what spirit said, do no intentional harm to yourself or others. Right. And they were intentionally coming there trying to do me harm when I've done nothing to them. You know, I've been called a grief vampire or anything. You know what? I'm not an ambulance-chasing psychic. If someone wants to avail themselves of my services, pick up the phone and call me. I don't have an email list. We don't send emails to my clients. We don't call them at whatever. 
Sometimes I'll run a special on social media or I'll advertise my services there. But you know what? Other people do that too. I'm not trying to foster a dependence on me or my skills with any of my clients. Not going to happen. And as a matter of fact, I have a rule. You know, I'm not going to be 1-800-DIAL-THE-DEAD. I'm not going to be that. I have a rule that with each individual client, like if you call me and ask me to talk to grandma and you call me again and want to talk to grandma, I talk to her twice for you. After that, we ain't doing it. We ain't doing it. <laughs> um, well, I mean, those are some great stories. And uh, Chip, I think everybody's looking forward to you to come to the Dells in just a couple you know, of weeks. I, let me just add one thing. You know, I've been there before. I was there for actually a filming of Psychic Kids. I didn't get to enjoy what the Dells has to offer. So this time I'm going to try to immerse myself in the experience of being back in that lovely place. So I'm really, lo- the only thing I'm not looking forward to is it's going to be cold, I think. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's March 17th. It's not going to be negative. So you escape that, but it's not going to be warm. I'm going to dress warmly, I think. I'm going to pack some really warm clothes because I'm anticipating being cold. Well, the thing is, uh, the one good thing about Chip that we always know you'll recognize him at a convention because he's the only other guy than me who's wearing a scarf. Hallelujah to that. <laughs> so, I'll bring you a scarf. I'll bring you a scarf. <laughs> oh, I, I, unfortunately, I'm going to be in Texas when you're here, but uh, we're going to have people from the uh, Madison and Wisconsin Dells Ghost Tours uh, coming up to visit and checking out. And if you guys out there, you can save 15% on your ticket if you type in ghost15 ghost15 uh, and the link is going to be right there on othersidepodcast.com slash 286 so you can pick up and you can enjoy St. Patrick's Day um, with this a remarkable character and you're going to have a lot of fun uh, at the uh, Chip Coffee event in the Dell so Chip thank you so much for your time today we thank absolutely you. appreciate it and good luck to you you know I appreciate that so much it's been lovely to be here with you I think your message is positive and um, I, ho- I hope you just keep it up Thank you, sir. One of the most memorable things Chip Coffey said during our conversation was when he mentioned that he asked his spirit guides or angels or whoever's talking to him about the meaning of life. What is the purpose of existence? And they answered with a simple and direct message. Don't be a dick. Well, that's good advice whether you're looking for the meaning of it all or just a good reminder next time you want to yell at somebody or be mean or just in general when you're having a conversation. So we took that as inspiration for this week's song. Here's Sunspot with Don't Be a Dick. As low as you can go Like a flat tie in the heat Underneath the pile of, At the bottom of the heat I said to my old man What's the meaning of it all? Well, you brought me into this You got some kind of balls He said, son, you know I love you But I don't know that much I tried to put you on the right path Being good and such But I know it doesn't mean a lot the same cliche If you remember just one thing Remember when I say When I say Don't be a dick You ain't got much time And every moment you spend mad Is one less moment of your life Don't be a dick Let me be clear Righteous anger has a way Of taking time off your good years When my worries and my troubles were more than I could bear I came to a crossroads and said a little prayer I fell down on my knees and I screamed up at the sky For the first time in my life there came a reply Don't fret my child, think the lilies of the field Waving with the wind, their serenity, their shield There are things you can't control And some will leave your life destroyed I made a lot of rules But there's just one that counts, my boy Don't be a dick You ain't got much time And every moment you spend mad Is one less moment of your life Don't be a dick Let me be clear 
Roger Sanger has a way of taking time off your good years. Don't be a dick. You ain't got much time. Every moment you spend mad is one less moment of your life. Don't be a dick. Let me be clear. Roger Sanger has a way of taking time off your good years. So don't be a dick. Thank you for listening to today's episode. You can find us online at othersidepodcast.com. Until next time, see you on the other side. Hello, it's Wendy. Thank you so much to Mike and to Chip Coffee for that great discussion today. It was really fun to hear because we've been seeing Chip at all these different paranormal conferences over the years, as well as, of course, on television. And it was just really, I thought it was fun to hear some more about the story of his life and the unique experiences that he's had as a psychic medium. Thank you for listening today. Just a quick reminder that you can always find our show notes for every episode at othersidepodcast.com. And a huge thank you to our Patreon community. Now, that's a place where you can join, and by donating each month, you have access to all of our brand new music before everybody else does. We have side discussions. We have a private Facebook group. And we have monthly hangouts where we all get together live online and chat about our favorite topics, usually including a lot of paranormal news and also pop culture items that we're enjoying at the time, such as movies and television and books. If you would like to join that community, it's easy. Just visit othersidepodcast.com slash donate, and that'll take you straight to our Patreon page where you can see all the different levels that you can uh, pledge at. And on that note, I give a special shout out, special, the huge thank you to our Patreon member, Dr. Ned, who donates at a level that he gets this custom special thanks every episode. And it is truly a huge heartfelt thank you, Ned. You know, we love you and we appreciate all that you've contributed to our cause here at See You on the Other Side and Sunspot. Thanks again to everyone. We love all of our Patreon members, and we love all of you for listening. Really appreciate it, and hope to see you out at a live event soon. Have a great week. Just don't be a dick.